cool. Let me begin. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Today we host Sara Baranzoni. Um, she uh, obtained her PhD in theater and cinematographic studies, and she is now professor of performance and research for performing arts at the University of Arts of Guayaquil in Ecuador. And she's also adjunct lecturer at the Technological University of Dublin in Ireland. She focuses uh, on philosophy of technology, political ecology, and performance studies. She has published uh, many essays in Italian, French, Spanish, English, and she is co-founder of the International Journal La Louisiana and a member of the Latin American Studies Network on Deleuze and Guattari and the Digital Studies Network. She also coordinator of the U Artists of the International Project Networking Ecologically Smart Territories, which is an horizon project funded by the European Union. So today she'll share with us a research on after politics governing by art. So I'll give her the floor and I'll thank her a lot for being here today, sharing her research with us. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. And thanks to everybody for the invitation and for this space. Uh, I'm uh, very glad to be here and presenting uh, my research with you. I hope that it is not too uh, long and uh, difficult to follow. Um, if there is any question or any point in which you would like to intervene, please don't hesitate. Uh, it's not a problem for me to be interrupted. So uh, uh, if there is a dialogue taking place, uh, it will be a great opportunity to discuss. Uh, okay, so uh, let's begin. And thanks also to Marco for uh, organizing all this and for to the participants and to everybody of this platform which is very interesting to me okay let's begin uh, with this presentation that it is it's called that is called uh, as emilia already mentioned after politics governing by effects um well, the main goal of this talk as uh, announced is to rethink some issues of contemporary philosophy and politics in light of the challenges of digitalization. It is a work in progress, so um, probably I will not give any answer to these questions that I will open, but uh, it is obviously open to discussion and to uh, any uh, feedback that you may uh, desire to give. So. Uh, really any uh, intervention is very welcomed. Okay, so what does uh, rethinking uh, some contemporary philosophy and politics issues in light of challenges of digitalization mean? Well, from what I think, rethinking doesn't mean exactly to throw away all that we have, but retaking some concept that was built according to a specific necessity in time and space and in relation with a contingent state of things and operate some maintenance, right? According to a deep analysis and the diagnosis of our present, that is to read the symptoms of disease of our times and uh, as a philosophical gesture that means to take care of thought and its tools. In this vein, uh, what I would like to analyze now is how the governance and the public sphere are acting in relation to social and individual bodies. And uh, uh, in relation with this, there are some key concepts that should be rethought and in some cases updated. For instance, uh, when we think to the government or managing of bodies, one of the first concepts that uh, occurs to us is that of biopolitics. I guess that everybody has heard uh, of biopolitics at least once, but uh, just to, to remember, biopolitics was uh, uh, outlined by Foucault in the late 70s in order to analyze some logics of power 
emerging in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is very important. Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, temporal framework is very important. And uh, biopolitics refer to the processes by which human life at the level of a population emerged as a distinct political problem in Western society. So it has to do with human life and bodies at the level of population. It has also been defined as the field in which the practices through which the network of powers manage the disciplines of body and the regulation of the population act. So this is an area in which power and life met. And this meeting occurs in a precise moment that is the one of the explosion of capitalism precisely in 18th and 19th centuries. So put in, an, in other words, the originality of Foucault proposal is the recognition of a particular mechanism of power that instead of simply repressing, began to enable and allow certain types of circulation on the basis of liberalism that is recognizing some freedom as a terrain for governing. But the problem with biopolitics is that uh, this has often been taken as an absolute phenomenon, uh, which means uh, not linked to a specific situation in time and space, and also often reduced to the managing of a bios uh, in its most immediate naturality, as if something similar could exist. Here, in light of a philosophy of technology and in particular of Bernard Stiegler philosophy of techniques, we would like to affirm that such life uh, could never be separated from the artifacts that are at stake in this managing and manipulation. So we cannot uh, think to life as such without relating it with artifacts and with social organizations. Um, this interpretation is indeed in line with Foucault's assertions when he said that power is always to be considered in, his, in its investment into institutions, techniques, and tools, which allow its material intervention as well as real and effective practices. In other words, biopolitics should be reconducted to its technique and technological dimension, highlighting that today, its managing principles are not only acting on the biological dimension, meaning uh, by this such things as the growth of wealth, the extension of lives, the enhancement of biological matter, but mainly on behaviors, right? So not only on the biological dimension, but mainly on behaviors. And with this on a larger and undetermined social, social cultural sorry, dimension that has to do with bodies and their technological extensions, what Stiegler calls exosomatizations. So it's a production of organs outside the body. So that are technological organs. Okay, uh, this was a kind of premise and uh, uh, um, a, a way of showing uh, what kind of operation I am trying to, to do, right? Taking some key concepts that come from uh, the, the history of uh, contemporary philosophy and try to uh, see what does not function anymore with them and try to update in light of a contemporary uh, situation. Right, so. In other places, uh, myself with Paolo Vignola, we have affirmed that the present epoch that we live in is characterized by what we call an extractivist image of thought, which define a plural, heterogeneous, and multiple phenomenon of extraction that includes all aspects of life. So in a Deleuzean sense, an image of thought is a dogmatic prescription typical of each epoch of how it is possible to think of what thinking means and namely uh, thinking means to go naturally toward through uh, truth and uh, also uh, an image of thought tells us what should be thought 
so uh, the image of thought is a way of organizing, I repeat, what it is possible to think, what thinking means, and how to think. So, um, in this sense, it is a way of thinking and producing knowledge that establishes the plane of conceptual creation and action of our present, right? So affirming that uh, we are now experiencing an extractivist image of thought means that there is something like an extractivist reason that seems to dramatically guide the three ecological sphere of what Guattari called ecosophy. So the environment, the social and the mental sphere. So therefore, practically every aspect of human existence. So the uh, extractivist reason uh, has to do with all these aspects. So despite uh, the seriousness of the environmental problem, it would nevertheless be a theoretical and political error to uh, limit extract the diagnosis of extractivism to uh, an environmental problem to the extent that uh, the rather industrial logics and various extractive companies uh, that uh, uh, not only uh, operate on the dispossession of common goods like land, water, energy, uh, primary uh, materials, uh, raw materials, etc., but that this extractivist uh, reason is also being applied as also being and is also being applied to other sectors, such as uh, uh, monoculture, agri-food industries, uh, uh, GMOs, and bioengineering, but also to mobility services, logistics, tourism, etc. And all this largely thanks to the huge mining activities of uh, uh, companies that uh, um, recollect data and information uh, in line with the politics of what is called platform capitalism. So in this regard, um, it is important to note how uh, the pandemic condition of the last two years have been revealing this pan-extractivist discourse that seems to define our time. In the first place, um, uh, the, um, we, we all know that uh, the, the pandemic has been generated, or at least the conditions for the pandemic to spread has been generated uh, by the jump of the coronavirus to the human species uh, in a way that is linked to extractivist processes. Uh, from mining, uh, from uh, uh, exploitation of uh, some territories and mines uh, and uh, uh, hydrocarbon plants, uh, agribusiness and biopiracy. And secondly, also of uh, equal importance, the way in which the health crisis has been managed is nothing more than extractivist in the sense of the extractivism of both data and emotions and its consequent totalizing form of control. So it is impossible, I think, to deny that during the pandemic, data extractivism has intensified enormously through geolocated contacts, tracing, the platformization of all social health aspects related to the pandemic, the massive use of social network, the um, a smart everything that we all have experienced, etc., generating a huge social experiment capturing value of life. At the same time, feelings of fear, anguish, horror, effort, among others, have been shaped and modulated by algorithms precisely through the incessant and systematic mining of data until transforming the ecology of the affections that govern a society and thus leading to a social and generalized existential crisis. This is the key point of the talk, but to arrive to this, I have to pass through several issues and I hope that, I repeat, it is not too long. 
So um, in this occasion, as I already told, I would like to concentrate on the massive extraction of data already at stake, at least in the last two decades, but that has touched, as I said, an unprecedented dimension during the pandemics. One that Naomi Klein has defined as Green New Deal in order to point to the role of the big digital platforms that taking advantage of something that she calls a pandemic a state of shock have implemented and increased their pervasivity. Uh, all this gives the opportunity to experiment with new technologies of power and telecontrol where, of our, uh, where our new jailers are our own connected digital devices, as Preciado say. And uh, by this, um, the digital platform has uh, uh, created a kind of living laboratory for a permanent and highly profitable no touch future. Uh, this is uh, uh, what is analyzed in by Naomi Klein in her article Screen New Deal that is available online. Uh, in his last publications and seminars, uh, Bernard Stiegler analyzed this in terms of governmental effects. And according to him, this uh, passage, uh, this uh, situation mark, marks a passage from a government that was based on statistics and on the possibility of uh, something to occur uh, to uh, a governmentality that it is uh, conceived uh, starting from a generalized privatization of the uh, governance tools. In other words, uh, we can witness the passage from a public governmentality of the state, of the public thing, of the res publica, to a governance by generalized privatization, which, according to Stigler, is the destruction of the public thing, of the res publica. In this sense, we can also understand what several authors have described as the hijacking of democracy, which is put in place by the web. We all know that the web has had born as a democratic dream, which generated a lot of hopes and had also been enthusiastically welcomed through the deleuze watarian mm -hmm. metaphor of the rhizome that is as a place of multiplicity, able to grow without establishing any internal hierarchy and producing uh, such matters which are differently formed and that follow different direction. But this easy enthusiasm reveals to be completely critical since it doesn't take into account the economic model based on profit on which this growth is based and not even the crypto arborescent organization that has configured through the connection of points that characterize the web. So there's no consideration of the economical uh, powers that uh, um, uh, are found beyond uh, the uh, growth of the network, of the, the internet, and also there is no consideration of the arborescent organization of it. Indeed, as Gert Lovink has affirmed in his essay, Said by Design on Platform Nihilism, we should abandon all these democratic illusions since the real model for the web is today the supermarket. These are words of Gert Lovink. Even if at the beginning, the knowledge developed through uh, the network seemed to be the most important good produced, this has soon be transformed into code and as such into profit for the few. So the current phase of the internet, according to Loving, but we completely agree, I completely agree with him, is one that has begun after 2008 financial crisis and that is defined by the rise of once again, an extractivist model where all 
from social media to platforms and any other node of the net has been redimensioned as a mere functional tool for the hyper growth of this few. In this case, we should admit, always following Lobink, that in the previous phase of the internet, the so-called rhizomatic thinking has prevented any strong network theory to develop because it had no interest in defining or confronting the hard question of how networks were going to supersede the static formalism of 20th century industrial relation. And thus, which managing model they will uh, have ended in following. If Jenny Morozov too agrees with the idea that indeed the networks don't replace or weaken hierarchies and that in fact, they amplify them just making them less visible. So all this reveals something that could be understood by reading Benjamin Bracton the stack. Uh, Bracton says that uh, what is at stake, it is a real oligopoly of digital platforms through which the web is aiming, and I quote, to rationalize the self-directed maneuvers of users without necessarily superimposing predetermined hierarchies onto their interactions. So the transparency of the uh, uh, web is indeed hiding a clear hierarchy that being hidden is not perceived by the user that have this idea of uh, freedom, democracy, etc., but that in fact are continuously rationalized and um, uh, governed and uh, uh, addressed. But the question is, is there any political plan under all this? Well, in his attempt to create a holistic, philosophical, systematic model capable of explaining the design and organization of the digital revolution, and in order to think about the technical arrangement of all layers of computing as a whole, Breton shows us the distribution of different scales of computation, which, according to him, has formed almost by chance. What well, this means that, according to him, the architecture or megastructure of the web is accidental. That is to say that it is not the result of a precise policy or of a particular plan, but rather of a form of accumulation which proceeds from the multiplicity of attempts to solve problems through technologies. So what we have now as a multiplicity of platforms, of multiplicity of stacks, that is of plans, of organization of this mega machine is, according to Bracton, completely accidental. There is no plan uh, behind all of this. On the other hand, if a platform is traditionally uh, and economically understood as a company participating in the market, it cannot be reduced only to this. Breton considers the platform as a generative, new and hybrid form of organization, which has already reached a scale of global institution while absorbing the function of states in providing services to user citizens. And this is also uh, linked to what Naomi Klein says in her uh, article, Screen New Deal, there is a pact, there is a, a, an agreement, a silent, a hidden agreement between states and platforms, uh, which makes a platform de facto to substitute uh, the public functions. So platforms have become de facto states with the difference of being less centralized, more diffused, and reprogrammable according to the needs of the users. So there is a kind of a computational sovereignty that challenges the political geography of the nation states. Um, 
I'm, I'm skip a little point and uh, pass to a second uh, issue that is important to uh, uh, highlight. So um, a very powerful concept that help us to understand what is at stake with all this data mining and with all this uh, uh, platform infrastructure is that of algorithmic, algorithmic governmentality described by the Belgian philosophers of right Antoinette Rouvroy and Thomas Burns in 2013 as the association between a highly invasive technological system of capture, discretization and transformation into data of behavior, choices, attitudes and more generally of all information on individuals, group entities, etc. And the correlation, the computational correlation of such raw data through algorithms capable not only of statistically predicting the trends and directions of individuals and collectives, but also of orienting them directing and promoting certain behaviors or stemming the possibility that others' behaviors may occur. Uh, since it is a very subtle and tendentially totalizing form of government, every aspect of individual and social life, sooner or later, must or must be progressively captured by the profiling devices and this so that their modeling can be effectively predictive. But, just a second. What interests me beyond uh, the government, governmental effect is also uh, the heuristic epistemological power of algorithmic governmentality, which calls into question at the same time is held by different concepts coming from the French philosophy of the 60s and 70s. So uh, it takes, uh, uh, it uh, uses and criticizes at the same time concept, concepts such uh, governmentality and regimes of truth, uh, of Foucault, the individuation, trans individual, the disparity of the Simondon, as well as the rhizome, the machinic unconscious of Deleuze and Watari. Indeed, uh, in the analysis inherent in uh, the theory of algorithmic governmentality, uh, Benz and Rouvois um, base all uh, their uh, analysis uh, on this key concept and socio-political perspectives, uh, but at the same time, these concepts and perspectives are subjected to a lucid and disenchanted diagnosis in which they, this concept, appear as prey to the ideology of real time, immediacy, infinite connection, and immanence. As such, algorithmic governmentality presents itself as a tool for a critique of the current becoming of certain concepts by indicating that it represents a foreclosure of ideals and a neutralization of this concept that being conceived in the 70s and 80s as ideals of emancipation. So uh, the big data ideology ends by uh, the um, uh, potentiating all the concepts that have been founded, have been thought to uh, as ideals of uh, emancipation, uh, in fact, uh, eating them and reconducting them to its own dynamics. Um, so for instance, we can see uh, in this uh, situation something that we can uh, call as the dream of immanence uh, uh, coming uh, to reality, or also we can see the thought of the outside of the loose uh, 
uh, talking about Foucault, etc. So we can see many of these concepts totally depotentiated and used uh, to reinforce what is not at all emancipatory. Algorithmic governmentality also suggests a possible goal for the massive extraction of data that I already mentioned, that is the one of controlling people by anticipating their behaviors and orienting them preventively. Uh, this seems to be in line with what Deleuze called controlled societies, described as such in the post-critum of controlled society, but uh, which to be fully understood uh, should also be confronted with the thousand plateaus, right? Uh, this because uh, in a thousand plateaus, um, there is a particular focus on the molecular dimension that is at the core of such modulation of governmental tendency. So it is precisely by focusing on the micropolitical dimension that we would like here to propose the idea that the contemporary mode of governance should not avoid a confrontation with the return of the Foucauldian question of discipline. So it is in line with uh, control societies, but also recuperates something of discipline by this adding a new di dimension to control. Briefly, a hypothesis or our hypothesis that I um, tried to stress in a several uh, essays with Paolo Vignola is that the many imperatives that are characterizing our present are contributing to the realization of a new form of discipline, which passes through tools which taking advantage of the condition of possibility uh, or that the so-called societies of control had created over the last 30 years in the processes of subjectiva uh, subjectivation and in existential territories, fabricate calculable and anticipable individuals, or better, individuals, as Rouvois and Burns argue in their theory of algorithmic governmentality. So, Control societies have made us addicted to algorithms and digital objects. And uh, as Stigler would say, proler proletarianize us at a symbolic level. So our imagination, our affections are completely uh, leveled all the exception and all the incalculable dimension are erased or reduced to calculable particularities. We could talk uh, to, uh, about this in terms of hyper-control, as Stigler suggests. We can also uh, quote uh, Juicy Parika uh, saying that uh, the control is now not limited on the anthropomorphic bodies of humans, but increasingly on the technological bodies of network culture. Uh, I would like to uh, say that is not just the technological or the human, but the complex um, interaction entanglement of them that it is now that is now under control and discipline. The idea is that by this new form of discipline control, um, the idea is that uh, the goal is no longer as in discipline to manufacture docile bodies or. Uh, individuals, subjects that are able to respond to the imperative of uh, the market and politics, neither to uh, control by modulating behaviors. Uh, the goal is now rather to design docile minds, minds that are not critical, not capable of support, 
but gregarious, fearful, calculable, predictable, and uh, uh, through the mixture of uh, new screens, new fears, the digital is uh, really reinforcing uh, some security measures that have been imposed and as we have experimented in the last period. So uh, the combination of uh, these impositions of this uh, control and discipline uh, situation, algorithmic governmentality, platform capitalism, etc., cetera, um, is creating a perfect terrain in order to regulate the docility and the calculation of lives. Um, okay, just a little uh, synthesis to uh, recapitulate some point and then go straight to the conclusion. Just a second. So, we talked about algorithmic governmentality that makes possible to assert the power of capital over the world of life to the point of being able to speak of an eco-biopolitical expropriation in the sense of a systematic control of biological and social life in general, which is an absolute extraction of all that is vital in life, that is the reduction of anything vital to data can be that can be manipulated and used to any extent. So we also affirm that to understand this, the concept of biopolitics uh, or even the biopower is no longer useful because it has to be uh, crossed with uh, the technological and artifactual sphere and also with the economic rationality that uh, characterize today all aspects of society, including life as such. We all know that the state relies on the market as a regulating principle and also legitimize itself as a market actor. So biopolitics is not just something that has to do with life, but must be reoriented towards its technical and technological dimension, emphasizing how its management principles no longer apply only to the biological, but, may, but uh, begin to apply also, and in particular, as I said before, to behaviors. Um, this means, and this is my ending point, which is included also in the title of this presentation, this means that finally, what or which is the subject of this algorithmic governmentality? To who applies this algorithmic governmentality? To, 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 to what extent we can, if we cannot uh, think to life as such, if we not, cannot think to um, uh, a subject that is self-sufficient uh, or uh, conceived as a substance that has properties to be um, organized, if it's not a subject that is created in order to respond to any particular um, order of society, well, uh, as Rura and Burns say, um, the subject of algorithmic governmentality um, are not physical bodies, are not moral consciousness, but some pre-individual and pre-conscious instinctual level that is targeted by uh, this soft power that tries to organize uh, all uh, aspects of lives. 
we could call this profile, for instance, but I think that there is something in the profiles that should be analyzed further. Um, Once again, it would be a mistake to link all this to the affective power, uh, to, the, to, to the body as such as if uh, it were a self-sufficient totality, a property of an organic subject. The subject as such no longer interests contemporary capitalism. Contemporary capitalism is rather interested in specific traits of subjectivity that serves it precisely as not yet formed. So something that is uh, previous to the individual, previous to the subject. Um, so the profile is characterized as a statistical body or set of uh, agency segments or function faculties which could be affected. As John Protevi uh, puts it, we human beings cease to be substances individuated by properties, but uh, become processes understood as singular patterns of social, neural, and somatic interaction. So what he says is that uh, we are what we can do with others, which means we are caught and interpreted as produced by a radical relationality. That is, we do not have relation, but we are relations. And this radical relationality, uh, relationality has now become the precise target of the political control thanks to this environment, these platforms, which I already described, and in which brains and bodies are continuously merged. Okay, so the, the, the final hypothesis of all this is that this sub-individual level on which algorithmic governmentality relies is not just that of profiles, but specifically that of affects. Affects uh, uh, intended as non-subjective emotion, as Deleuze and Guattari would say. What does it mean? It, it, it means that, uh, well, we must be clear when we, we speak of affects, that we are not referring to emotions or feelings because affect rather refers to a bodily capacity uh, or a capacity of matter as such to affect or to be affected in the sense that Spinoza gives in his ethics. Today, according to Brian Masumi, affects must be re-thematized not only in relation to bodies, but also to technologies and organizations. So this is perfectly in line with, with what I said before. And it is also confirmed by uh, under the lines in uh, Burns and Rubois theory when they state that what algorithmic governmentality does is indeed affecting in advance. So inaugurating a new regime of affect within which um, affect uh, are indeed, uh, sorry, I'm very redundant, affecting our power to act. So there is a kind of automatic production of the possible, right? I know it's very complex but uh, to, 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 to say, but not that difficult, I, I guess, to understand. Uh, if we think uh, affects as a bodily way of being ready, a kind of a trigger for action, uh, including the action of feeling an emotion, right? But what I would like to say is that algorithmic governmentality act before the formation of the emotion, because emotion are subject specific. There is a subject that is uh, that feels an emotion, while 
the affect is unconscious a subjective state. To put it simple, it is a physiological change in and of the body prior to the recognition that I am feeling this way, okay? So it is a kind of vector of unqualified intensity that can be opened up to future actualization. If we, if we think this way, it becomes clear how through all the technical infrastructure that we have tried to describe um, quickly, uh, capitalism is increasingly targeting these non-cognitive brain functions and exploiting this radical relationality also based on the neuroscientific arguments that demonstrate how the perturbation and disturbances of somatic sensations elicited by certain non-elaborated feelings, that is effect, can condition the conscious response and provoke automatic responses which derive in episodes of rage, fear, uh, and collective hysteria that are not fully understood as such because they don't uh, pertain to a subjective and conscious dimension. What this produces is a collective desubjectivization. Okay, so this leads to some important implications. First, it is not possible today to continue to talk to bodies and human beings as organic or homeostatic closed system in search of a kind of balance, as uh, Maturana and Varela said in their theory of autopoiesis, but it is required a kind of thought that Stigler would define organological that put all together um, various kinds of organs, the somatic organs, the exosomatic organs, that is artificial organs, and all the organization that tries to link together all these dimensions. Then another implication in political terms is if we cannot think to mere bodies, mere human dimension, mere subjectivities. We already said that biopolitics that has to do with human life is not, uh, it has to be uh, updated. We could think to micropolitics in the sense of Deleuze and Guattari that uh, has to do with the perception, desire, processes of subjectification, but it seems not even enough. Maybe, perhaps, we should begin to think to a kind of nanopolitics in the sense of uh, something that arrives prior to subjects that is a physiosomatic affection, right? So it has nothing to do with perception, with desire, with subjectification that are conscious processes, but comes before. Uh, Luciana Parisi analyzes uh, the, the, the role of fear and what is previous to fear uh, in, in terms of effects precisely to make us understand how the uh, generation of automatic uh, responses and uh, automatic uh, reaction um, are uh, pure affective facts that uh, organize and influence the possibility of rationalizing the irrational. Uh, Brian Masumi calls this radical neoliberalism. I do not have time now, I guess, to uh, deepen this aspect on, uh, on fear, uh, but uh, maybe I can just uh, uh, synthesize uh, mentioning one uh, very last point that uh, Parisi calls uh, power over futurity. There is a final aspect in all this that is the possibility of staging futures 
precisely in order to administrate, control, and discipline these do docile minds that I uh, tried to stress before. So, very uh, synthetically, if power no longer acts on bodies, on subjects, but on precise features, how is it possible to uh, um, uh, create actors that are uh, included into a kind of politics or a kind of uh, um, governing and managing of the current societies. The idea, the, 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 what uh, Parisi tries to show is that this is played through the uh, modulation and regulation of affects and of precise stimuli, precisely playing with memory. That is to say, if uh, uh, previously neoliberalism used data to predict and prevent the future from the past, I mean, um, analyzing past behaviors, uh, correlating data in order to create models uh, for future behaviors in order to prevent them, radical neoliberalism is no more based on prevention, but on the actualization of the effects. What this means is that, for instance, by showing the, the future possibility of something to occur, it is created a liberation of affects that create a general feeling of fear of the future that is brought into the present as an effective fact. So, uh, very schematically, is not by seeing the past that we can govern the future, but is by seeing the future that we can govern the present by staging the future, by presenting the future as a, a menace, as a, a, a very frightening situation, okay? There is an effective uh, triggering of the present that inaugurates an operation uh, that uh, Masumi um, relate with what he calls radical neoliberalism, right? All based on affect. Okay, so uh, we, can, we can easily understand that by staging this, uh, this uh, fear of the future, the affect turns into, turn into a kind of neurosensory weapon that has performative effects, not only in the present, but also in the future, right? So the past is almost erased. And all is played in a strict relation between future and present. So the question is now, what kind of politics or which kind of policies should be thought? And this is the question that I would like to leave open to further reflections because the, 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 the response is not that easy to think. What kind of politics, what kind of policies should we think to in order to counter effect or in order to confront this situation in which we are governed uh, on such subtle and almost invisible dimension? Should we, as uh, Frederic Lordon seems to uh, suggest, organize a new politic also based on this kind of mechanisms, or should we think to another form of uh, making politics? Should we, uh, uh, should we act in line with this affective capitalism? Should we crit just criticize this new aspect of the extractivist image of thought, that is the extractivism of effects? 
Should we continue to think to what a body can do or to what a brain can do? Or should we think rather to what a profile can do? All these are questions that uh, implies and include ethical dimensions because uh, there are uh, stakes, there are at stake issues that uh, are very complex in relation with everyday life and behaviors of populations and uh, people as such. Thank you for your attention and sorry for uh, trying to summarize a little bit uh, some questions that are very complicated to a certain extent. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, well, let me just, um, I just would like to say thank you one more, one more, because I'd like to stress the fact that now we are almost at the end of this cycle of seminars. So what I found very interesting in your presentation is that you mentioned concepts that have been used here throughout the seminar. So uh, when uh, we spoke about extraction of data in different fields, we talk about green grabbing, the struggles with uh, over environmental debt and national moral economy. We spoke about cryptocurrencies, so the, the idea of mining in cryptocurrencies. And we had conversation uh, uh, about participation, especially with uh, Giuseppe Micciarelli in urban areas. We spoke about platform and governmentality, institutions. So they're all um, aspects that we mentioned here. And what I found very interesting is the fact that somehow those concepts are back and back again. Um, the uh, CAS also organized a summer school on digital democracies uh, organized by uh, Marco Luca here and Gabriele Giacomini. And we worked all together on this concept. So they really are at stake. They really are the main point and not also for philosophy, but also for um, uh, every kind of, of reflections uh, engaged with uh, contemporary issues. So again, thank you very much because I think that you uh, used the most interesting concept that we, uh, we, have, we have here. Um, uh, of course, I have questions for you, but I prefer to uh, open the floor and uh, wait for others to uh, show themselves and ask for clarification or trying to answer to your question. So thanks again, and please show your hand if you want to comment or uh, if you have any question. Marco Luca, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, for a great talk. Uh, of course, I, I have like a million of questions or comments and that it's a very sort of, rich talk, so there, there are numerous topics that, that we could focus on. And as Emilia said, thank you, Emilia, very much. We, we have been discussing many of these in many sort of from different perspectives and so forth. But I would just sort of, there's just one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I would essentially want to see your thinking about this much more than, than um, necessarily that it's related to something within the talk as such. But it is related to, to a topic that you mentioned. This is. I wonder if, and it goes back to, to the sort of set of questions that you listed at the end of how we move forward once we have somehow diagnosed the situation to, to, to again, from many different perspectives and we do see that there are many sort of potential areas of intervention and so forth. But on the sort of, on a conceptual level, I keep wondering whether, how, so the question is this, um, once we have, how can we avoid, for instance, this uh, sort of affective, ex extractive extraction of affect for purposes of social media? I mean, this is, this is one of the sort of key points is this, that the, the current version of social media, Web 2.0 or however we're gonna call it, is based on, on this sort of extraction of, of affect for profit purposes primarily, and then, but this, in, in, leads towards this sort of um, 
um, towards basically organizing our uh, communicative, social, and, and epistemic to a point, and also some kind of uh, organizational capacities instead of towards certain. So I think it sort of um, it denies it sort of uh, it presents an obstacle also to some kind of collective action and so forth, and it leads towards sort of a, it leads towards all all kinds of, of problems with regards to these sort of social and political and epistemic and, and communicational and deliberative sort of uh, issues. And this is quite I think clear, but I'm always wondering how can we avoid this while not, not falling into the trap of uh, sort of idealized rational public deliberation. You know what I mean? How do we sort of uh, do not go into the sort of, because there is, a, there is this tendency that e either we are sort of, there is this sort of whole school of thought in which, of course, Habermas and so forth, in which this sort of public deliberation, public or social action of any form has to be guided through this idealized rational uh, process, which I think is, again, a form of, of a, both epistemologically and politically really, really flawed idea of how the society works and how the society organizes itself. And I think we want to incorporate the sort of affective aspect of society. I think they are sort of, they have a functional side of signaling things. They have a functional side of, of sort of emphasizing relevant relevance within the sort of very confusing and messy social reality and so forth. And I think that we need this effective aspect. And now the effective aspect is sort of, as you said, it's extracted. It focuses on this sort of very sort of specific, like we're talking always in terms of emotions, which are not effect, I understand, but sort of like, but it, there is this fear, paranoia, this sort of uh, impossibility of the future and so forth. So, but, I, I always wonder how is it possible to still retain the sort of affective and but avoid the sort of extractive aspect of the platforms while not falling into the sort of this clear rational uh, uh, idealized idea of public square. Many Thank thanks, Marco, for your question that is very articulated and uh, includes uh, a lot of uh, issues that I will try to articulate a little bit. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it is impossible to avoid extraction and that we should not think to a way of avoiding extraction. What, sh what we should avoid is extractivism, not extraction. To extract is a common uh, uh, activity and it is also useful. We extract, for instance, a quote from a text, we extract uh, many things in life. And uh, if this extraction is followed by a taking care of what is extracted and of the context in which this extraction takes place, I mean by this, by um, giving back something and uh, trying to uh, uh, re-equilibrate, uh, rebalance the, 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 the situation. Extraction as such is not a problem. The problem is extractivism as a logic of a separation of what is extracted by uh, the place or the person from which it is extracted. So, uh, the extractivism of affects becomes a problem when we are not um, conscious, we are not, um, we are not capable of uh, seeing what is at stake with this. So what I would, I would say is uh, we can't really avoid this affective extraction, but we should be very uh, conscious of it, we should try to analyze further how this all works, which kind of effects it produces to be um, very attentive also to the exploiting of uh, these uh, dynamics. Uh, what I would like to say with this is that uh, is, is, is very in line with um, what Stiegler's 
uh, what Stigler said uh, in relation with uh, technologies and in particular with social networks, social media, etc. We, it is not that we should abandon all this. It is not that we have to reject technologies and algorithms and calculations and data because they are too dangerous and because they are uh, destroying our lives. It is not possible. Everything is now based on this. It is really uh, uh, impossible to think to avoid all this dimension. What we can do is to know what is happening is to be conscious, is to be uh, aware of uh, how we are exploited by these mechanisms and dynamics and try to articulate, as you uh, suggested, a kind of collective social response, a kind of a, uh, uh, political proposal or a request to uh, transform uh, I, I'm using a, a, a couple, a thematic couple that Stigler used to use, that is uh, the, the difference between a state of fact and state of law, and state of right. So what we have here is a state of fact. As I said before, the stack, the, the, the mega structure is uh, happened um, by chance, is completely arbitrary what we have so it's a state completely state of fact what we need is a state of law what we need is something that tries to uh, regulate to decide what is permitted or not so we have to address all these ethical questions and issues and not just as you as you said before not just uh, ingenuously thinking that collective participation and deliberation will will be uh, the great solution to, to any issue, because it's not as easy as that. Um, I'm, for instance, um, I work in Ecuador. Ecuador and Bolivia, in their constitution some years ago, uh, recognized right, rights to nature, decide that nature has its own right that has, been, has to be respected. Perfect, marvelous incredible but how to translate this in something real in everyday life and behaviors because it is not enough to have the best principle ever written in your constitution or say that we need public deliberation or collective decision making is not enough we have to find concrete practices in order to counter effect this exploitation, this um, extractivisms that uh, limit us to a uh, little good to be exploited uh, for the profit of the few, as uh, I said before, quoting uh, Gert Loving, right? So it is very complex. R really, my, my uh, concern in in this last period is <laughs> what is happening with politics really because uh, we cannot really reduce politics to i influence you i uh, am affecting you by stimulating precisely this neurosensual uh, link or uh, synapses right i i i can't imagine that politics uh, can be reduced to this. And it is uh, urgent to find uh, another kind of, of response. Also, uh, I, I am sorry because I am oversimplifying the, 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 the issues at stake, but, uh, but they are very complex indeed. Thank you. OK, thanks. Does anybody else have questions or ideas, wants to share? Um, Valeria Fabrizzi said that he's very sorry not to be able to act actively participate in the discussion due to COVID, but that it 
thanks you, Sarah, a lot for your rich and interesting talk. Uh, okay, so if there are no more questions, I, um, I'd like to um, share one concern that I have, uh, one of many questions that I have for you, Sarah, uh, but just one in particular I'd like to uh, share with you now, uh, because uh, what you said that um, we are not anymore in the domain of, bio of biopolitics, which means that we are not focused anymore on bodies or minds, uh, but that now um, the, the key points is uh, affection, is relation, is something else. So this makes me think that uh, this is uh, very important in order to rethink also uh, what inequalities are into this system. Because if bodies are not uh, at stake as they used to be uh, before the use of technologies, let's say in the 70s where Foucault, when Foucault wrote, uh, I think, uh, how, how the question of inequalities change in this, in this scenario. Because sometimes we think uh, about technology like uh, some kind of angel that makes all inequalities disappear. But um, this is something that has been said also in regards uh, of um, uh, cryptocurrencies, for example, or also uh, at school, if, if I think uh, school uh, everybody said, claimed at the very beginning that technologies was the way to uh, destroy inequalities. Um, what do you think about this? Can we um, uh, picture new kind of inequalities that um, is uh, at stake here and how it is different from the one that we already know and that uh, we kind of uh, start to recognize as such and to preserve. So it's, it, I mean, it's for uh, people, but it's also, as you mentioned, for uh, nature and states and institutions and organizations and every kind of, not just uh, human bodies, but um, collectively uh, body. Thanks. Thanks, Emilia. Um, if I understood well, uh, your your question is focused on inequalities. That is uh, something that is related to uh, the creation of uh, gaps of uh, participation or access to technologies from the one hand and the other hand, the uh, inequalities uh, on a political level. Yes, because if it's just a physical inequality, let's say that I am on a wheelchair, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, started to figure out how to make uh, this situation, um, uh, how to uh, make this inequality right. So uh, we started to be in, a, in an architectural system where we have uh, we give access and uh, a little tiny bit of uh, elements that might help uh, this person. But I'm not just talking about people, really. Also, institution, uh, states, uh, also who is uh, who has the concept of uh, minority in, in Andalusian sense. Uh, so I wonder how this kind of inequality is changing a technological network and how we can. Uh, find out where they are hiding now and how we can possibly solve them. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. Well, the easiest answer would be uh, that inequalities changes because now they are not related to who you are, but to what you can or cannot do. So uh, it's not, important as you said if you are on a wheelchair or you are a minority okay because uh data profiling uh, is very interested particularly on differences because any difference enriches uh, the statistical body on which uh, the uh, correlations of data are organized uh, so really what now creates inequalities is uh, access, what is known as the digital divide, for instance, so who can or cannot have access to the internet or to uh, a digital uh, device. 
there are also inequalities, inequalities uh, related to the biases that are generated by this uh, data um, correlation. For instance, it is well known the, that most of these algorithms, well, algor an algorithm is not a neutral a mathematical expression, but has a theory behind it. And it is a tool that make a theory function. So on what these algorithms are based and on what the devices that has to work in pair with the uh, algorithms are based, are based on a 25 year old male, wh uh, white male guys that work in Silicon Valley. Okay, on their thought of how the world is. So, for instance, one of the uh, most uh, well known uh, problems that um, occurred with something that you might be familiar with that is the facial recognition and the biometrics that sometimes appear in some uh, website is that at the beginning they were not able to recognize black people because they have they they had been designed starting from a white uh, male point of view 25 years old etc american and blah 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 so this is an implicit bias that is or discrimination that is created at a certain point also there are uh, uh, more that are appearing, uh, but um, uh, at a certain point, one can also think that, okay, so if uh, the facial recognition doesn't recognize me, it is not a real problem. Indeed, it is an advantage because I can do or uh, avoid uh, some kind of uh, control, but it's not easy as that. Indeed, uh, the oversimplification uh, of which any of us is at a certain point a victim is one of the great illness of, of this period. So we, we should try to, to, to not oversimplify any, any question, but... Um, one, another another uh, question that tends to be oversimplified is the question of privacy, to which uh, very often the uh, protection that we need uh, when using uh, digital devices is linked to. I mean, uh, if in general people think, okay, I don't mind my privacy. I don't mind to share my data because I have nothing to hide. What I do is not dangerous. What I do is public. I have nothing to hide. I don't need to protect my thinking that the, the real danger of leaving a, a lot of data online is that of privacy, is that of being observed, is that of, and that is why I am so critical with uh, approaches that uh, continue to relate uh, uh, the activity, the, the, the control, the activities online to the idea of the panopticon, to which from uh, one point you can observe everybody and control everybody. And for this, I put so much effort to say that not even the control societies of Deleuze are a, a concept uh, enough updated in order to think what is happening today. We need some kind of discipline uh, tools to, in order to understand what, ha what is happening. Because in fact, what happens is not that we are controlled, we are read, or we are just interpreted by the machines or by Google or by any platform that we uh, used to uh, go in, but we are disciplined. Our behaviors are, are uh, affected, are changed, are directed uh, by 
the data that we live in this platform. So if we are not aware of this and we, sh and we continue to think, okay, I don't need to protect my priv privacy more than this, it is a great problem. And this also, this uh, unawareness of the problem also creates inequalities. Okay, so uh, it, it is very, very complex, this, uh, this, this subject. And last but not least point on this, another problem that is linked with this misunderstanding of what happens and of what can really discriminate or uh, minorize us today is linked with the uh, whole conception of technology. We, we still are linked to a um, instrumental idea of technology, which means that technology is conceived as a tool for doing something, right? So uh, these platforms uh, is, uh, I, I use this platform in order to book an apartment. I use this platform in order to call a taxi. I use this platform. So the, we still are into a subject object relation where I am the subject using by this tool, uh, an object or uh, relating myself or watching an object, etc. Uh, relating myself to something that is an object. It is all more complex than this. Technology should not be thought as a tool anymore. It is a, an actor. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari already gave to the inorganic some uh, extent of life. They, they, they thought to the, the, the life of the inorganic. Uh, it is very important to, to, to develop uh, strong theories and strong thought about uh, how, how our comprehension and understanding of technology has changed and should change again. Because if we do not, do not understand that the technology is an actor as such, and we still consider that it is just a tool, uh, we cannot really understand what is at stake with all this and continue to uh, put ourselves in the place of the minorized, of the excluded, of the uh, um, exploited people that are victims in a certain sense of this situation without being aware of being as such. So it's very complicated, but uh, the, 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 what, what is at stake is precisely to try to uh, open the black box as we often uh, listen in, in, many, in many situations. So try to see exactly what is at stake and how it works and uh, how it is possible to uh, to, to, to put all, get all together and, and think possibilities to, to counter effect or to, to, to go further. With the, with the uh, consciousness yeah, and awareness that uh, neoliberalism, radical neoliberalism as Masumi defined it, is very fast and very uh, able in uh, uh, recapturing all uh, new uh, possibilities of uh, thought, all new concepts of new ideas and exploiting them uh, for its uh, goals and aims. So it's a it's hard task, but important. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other question or are we satisfied with this very rich and interesting talk? Sarah, thank you very much for being with us, uh, for your rich conference and for the detailed answer that you gave to our questions. Thank you again. Thank you everybody for following this seminar and 
I'll give you the appointment to uh, next week with the CAS seminar. Thank you again. Thanks to you, and, and sorry for the extension of all this, but it is complicated. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Sara. And thank you, Emilia. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.